This is Deepal Parekh with Ravi Brambhat and Dr. Paul Wagner. We are continuing our conversation on ethics and leadership. Uh, today's focus is on uh, factors to consider when making judgments about controversial issues. Uh, Dr. Wagner, today I want to start with a question. Um, is there a problem with zero tolerance? What are your thoughts? There's, there's a big problem with zero tolerance. Yesterday, you'll remember when we talked about tolerance, we said that, um, that it, that's a good thing, of course, and that part of tolerance is recognizing that the other person has a right to be wrong. Now, in contrast to that, when we talk about zero tolerance, we're saying that we're not allowing for any mitigating circumstances at all um, when we condemn somebody else's behavior. It's a very odd thing to do because even our, our courts have forever recognized the role of mitigating circumstances. Everyone's heard about the difference between first degree murder, second degree murder, uh, manslaughter. Well, each of those categories um, reflects what the jury and the judge believe to be the intentions behind the death. In first degree murder, it's, it's an execution. And the intention is to deliberately take the life of another. And we say, that's really bad. And um, so we're gonna give you a heavy penalty for that. On second degree murder, we're saying there could have been mitigating circumstances. Uh, somebody came home and, and found their spouse um, in a compromising situation with somebody else. And um, they just happened to have a weapon handy nearby or whatever. And, 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 they, and, they, and they fly into a rage and they take this person's life. And so we say, you know, they it's not like they deliberately and, and carefully planned the execution of somebody, but they should have better control over themselves. And so we're gonna we're gonna punish them on grounds of second degree murder. And then the third one being um, manslaughter. Uh, somebody gets drunk and gets behind the wheel of a car. Now you shouldn't do that. And if you kill somebody in doing that, we're, we're going to punish you. But we certainly don't think that was an, an, a planned execution, and, nor was it the case uh, such as the second one I described where you came home, you saw a compromising situation that you know, your spouse was involved in, you flew off the handle, and yada, yada, yada. So the courts have always recognized mitigating circumstances affect how we ought to judge the rightness or wrongness, the severity or lack of severity of one or another um, actions. Now, for the public schools to lose a sense of how important that is to have that flexibility, to be that understanding, I, I, I don't understand that at all. I'll give you a couple of horrible examples that I've come across that made the public be very upset with public schools because they thought it was so unreasonable what the schools were doing under the guise of zero tolerance. I'll start with the easiest ones and then go to the, uh, the most harsh one. In Florida, there was a kindergarten kid and he, um, uh, had, wore, he had blonde hair and a flat top haircut and glasses about as thick as a, a bottoms of a coat ball. And during recess, he would run around and try to kiss the girls. I think that little kid shows up on all the playgrounds. And what he wants is just attention. They expelled him from kindergarten because the district had a zero tolerance policy on sexual harassment. I got a hunch the sexual harassment the district had in mind when it first put the policy together probably had a lot more to do with things that happen in high school than kindergarten. And uh, so this, this little boy seeking attention has an expulsion on his record at five years old. Uh, that made national news and it made the public scoff at the unreasonableness of public school administration. Second case that comes to mind. Don't remember quite where this was, but uh, you had a teacher who um, had asthma. And one day she shows up at work, she thought her asthma inhaler was um, still adequate should anything come up. And while she was uh, in class teaching, she started having an asthma attack and she went for her inhaler, nothing came out. And so she's desperate and she's choking. 
and uh, the students don't know what to do. They're in a panic, and they can see the teacher is turning sheep white and about to fall to the ground. And uh, this is in high school, and there happened to be a girl in that class who was asthmatic herself. She digs into her purse and pulls out her own inhaler. She runs to the rescue of the teacher, gives her the inhaler. The teacher uses the inhaler. It revives her. And somebody had run on down to get the nurse, and the nurse came in. But, you know, the nurse wasn't going to be able to take care of this had it not been for that student who already had provided the teacher with the inhaler. And so the nurse was delighted that this student was so conscientious, brave, thoughtful, that she uh, rescued, she saved the life of her teacher. Well, the uh, next day, the teacher was reprimanded and the student was expelled from school for three days. Why? Drugs. You're not allowed to um, distribute drugs in, in this district. And they counted that as distributing drugs. Once again, it made national news. Once again, public outcry, wondering what's wrong with our schools that you can't tell the difference between somebody selling crack cocaine to other students and a brave girl who rescues her teacher uh, with a, um, uh, an asthma inhaler. Extraordinary. Now, here's my last example, and, and this um, showed up on, I don't remember if it was Dateline or 2020, but a long time ago, in early, the early uh, 90s, I believe. But an extraordinary story, and uh, all about zero uh, tolerance policies. There was a young man who was salutatorian of his class, number two in his high school class, just a few days before graduation. Now, this young fellow uh, also happened to be an Eagle Scout, and uh, he was he was just as squeaky clean as you can imagine. And he had gotten a congressional appointment to one of the uh, military academies. I think it was West Point, but I'm not sure. In any case, um, he shows up at school. Just in the nick of time, I had overslept. Uh, at school, police officer saw something bulging in his uh, jeans pocket. So he has him empty his jeans pocket. Lo and behold, the Eagle Scout, and by the way, he was wearing his Eagle Scout shirt to school that day. Now, how many bad guys really wear an Eagle Scout shirt to school, right? It's not like a game color or something. So, um, he pulls out his Boy Scout knife. He had forgotten that it was in his pocket when he went to the meeting the night before. And like I said, he overslept and quickly grabbed his clothes, put them on to get to school right away. The officer takes him on down to the principal and the principal expels him. It's only a couple of days left in school. And so the none of the military academies will admit anybody who has ever been expelled from school. So um, this, this, this kid is having uh, his, his scholarship taken away because when you go to a military academy, everything is paid for. Your uniforms are paid for. Your room and board is paid for. They even give you allowances to when you go home to visit family and, and so on. And then when you come out, you've got a guaranteed job. I mean, this is amazing. And you've got one of the best engineering programs in the country in each of them military academies, and all this was being taken away from a young man because he rushed off to school in the morning. He was your second best student in the whole school, and um, uh, he had already merited a congressional recommendation, which was accepted, and um, he was going to go to a military academy. John Stossel was on with the Barbara uh, Walters uh, on this show. I don't know if it was Dateline or 2020, but the two of them used to be on together. And so he went out to the school district and talked to the superintendent. He said, how can you be doing this to this, this young man? And the superintendent was very stodgy. And he said, well, that's our policy. We have zero tolerance policies. And Stasso went through the whole explanation of why this didn't seem to be what this policy was meant to address. And so couldn't some allowances be made in this case? And the superintendent just turned his nose up at Stossel and said, I don't make the policies, the school board does. You need to take it up with them. I just administer them. Well, that's not true. You're, each of us is always responsible for what we do. 
And what that superintendent was doing was uh, taking this uh, opportunity away from the student. Now, some people might say, well, you know, what if he was just a street kid and he was selling crack? You know, he would get expelled even if it was the last three days of school. Um, shouldn't you treat everybody equally? Of course, you should not treat everybody equally. We spend disproportionate amounts of money on special ed students as opposed to regular students at school so that when their education is completed that these special ed students might have a better chance of competing with the students who don't require so much money being spent on them. And so we're treating them unequally, but we say the reason for doing that is because that's the only way to be fair to kids who come to us different from most of the other students and have these special needs. And so in this case, the superintendent obviously didn't understand that he wasn't even giving the same punishment to the student I just told you about or the hypothetical student who was selling crack cocaine. The hypothetical student selling crack cocaine was violating the, um, the rules, of course, and you know, they might be expelled for that. And that's certainly a, uh, it's, it's an unlawful uh, activity because you know, he's selling criminally condemned drugs uh, to school. Uh, he may even like being off uh, for three days because it gives him more of a chance to uh, uh, stock up on his inventory and sell some more crack cocaine. But this boy who was the Eagle Scout, he wasn't just getting three days off from school. He was losing a college education that was probably worth over $300,000 plus a guaranteed job afterwards. And the country was losing a fellow who might have been a really good military officer, very dedicated. And all of this because he slept late and he put on his clothes in a rush and came racing to school and accidentally still had his Boy Scout knife in his pocket. By the way, if you've ever seen a Boy Scout pocket knife, it hardly looks like the kind of knife that somebody who has evil intentions toward others is likely to carry around. Um, so this, this story became big news across the country. Well, not only was it on national TV and you've got Barbara Walters and John Stossel uh, talking about it, but when I, it went on for a couple of weeks afterwards with people going, my golly, what is wrong with school administration that they can't recognize between horrible acts of wrongdoing, which should be punished, and acts that behaviors that may look similar to, but with the different intentions involved are in fact very, very different actions. A bad guy may stick a knife, may even have a surgical knife and stick a knife right into somebody to kill them. And a surgeon may use a surgical knife and put that blade in exactly the same place in a patient that's on the table as the surgeon is trying to operate on them. And in each case, the person either on the operating table or the person that the bad guy was going to assassinate, you had a person die in each case. But no one thinks that the surgeon has done wrong, unless you bring other facts to bear on it. The surgeon was trying to save a life, and yet the behavior in each case was the same. This type of instrument was placed in exactly this place in this body. In one case, it was to save a life. In the other case, it was to take a life. Same behaviors, but with different intentions, we recognize they're different actions. The one to be applauded, even sadly, the other to be condemned for its wrongness. Zero tolerance policies are just no excuse for anybody in education to be so morally corrupt as to turn their heads on the very different things that may mitigate somebody's behavior and indicate that this action is quite different from the action our policy wanted to prohibit. Wow. Many people just like having it in black and white so they don't have to think about the, the depth, seriousness of trying to get at what's this action really all about? Wow, that's wow. profound. Um, 
being fair is not the same as being equal. No. Wow. Um, my next question to you is, is there a connection between racism and hate speech? Good question. Yeah, and the answer, of course, is um, yes and no. The um, uh, We often find people using hate speech when they're uh, directing hateful intentions toward uh, people of another race, another ethnic group, another religion, um, LGBT versus heterosexual, whatever it might be. So we often find hate speech present when um, uh, hateful attitudes are present. But it's not the case that hate speech and racism are all the same. You can come across somebody who is very clever and they will never use any hate speech because they don't want to inconvenience themselves. They don't want to get in trouble. It just isn't worth the risk. And yet this very same person is as prejudiced as can be. And humans are pretty good, or something called theory of mind. We humans do a pretty good job of understanding one another. And um, so we recognize when we're in the presence of somebody who hates us, is prejudiced toward us, even if they never say a word that would get them in trouble. Um, it's sociologically fashionable now to talk about macro oppression and micro oppression. And, and, and here, this is one of those areas where that would be, you know, appropriate. We know when that person who is prejudiced toward us is prejudiced toward us, but they may never use hateful speech at all. On the other hand, uh, people may use hateful speech when, um, and, and it's very really appropriate, it's morally appropriate, when they're talking about how some people do such wrong things to others. I, uh, I feel comfortable saying uh, I hate those who, who engage in human trafficking. I think that's awful. And, and, and I really hate that they do that to other people. And so uh, that would be hate speech, but it certainly wouldn't represent any racism. Uh, if anything, it'd be just the opposite of it. Also, one of the things that we have to worry about with hate speech, can it be abused where people claim that somebody is using hate speech when, in fact, they're not? They may be a bit awkward in what they're trying to say. We used the example yesterday of the phrase, you people. You know, that phrase can be used like, are you people in Friendswood? What are you people in Friendswood doing to... Um, um, treat the state's demands for standardized test increase this year. And that could seem very innocuous. On the other hand, somebody could say, well, what do you people think about so-and-so? Well, are they just excited about an issue or is that use of you people like, well, what do you people even do? What are you people even doing here or whatever it might be? Now that does sound really kind of mean. But how do you draw lines of demarcation between each of the three? Because certainly we really don't want to accuse somebody of hate speech who is innocently trying to communicate the same kind of thought that a person might when they say, what are you people doing in another school district to uh, get ready for this year's standardized tests? Um, so we have to be careful that uh, our uh, desire to protect um, people from racism or prejudice of all different kinds doesn't lead us to become freewheeling and abusive uh, in the way we, we talk about uh, each other's use of speech that may not be hate speech, but it's somebody appoints them and says, that, that, was, that was hate speech. We want to ensure as much openness for conversation mm -hmm as we can. Yesterday, we had also talked about the importance of keeping the conversation open in a, in a great conversation of humankind. If you intimidate people so they're afraid to talk, or saying the wrong thing, because it could cost them a job, it could cost them um, popularity in the class or whatever, you'll never know what they really think. You'll never be able to do things to help advise them to think differently, if 
that would be advisable. Um, if you don't keep the doors open to earnest reflection, discussion, explanation, and so on, all you're going to do is seed pockets of prejudice and hate among those people who keep quiet and to themselves and don't put it out in the open and say, let's talk about it. Well, it would be ideal to have a safe environment in that situation, right? Um, well, when I think of safe environment, one of the um, things to think of is, yeah, of course, with a great conversation, we've got to have a safe environment, you know, so people feel free to talk um, as we've just uh, discussed. You know, and that, that requires an attitude of respect by everybody in there, particularly by the school teachers themselves who are the leaders of the great conversation. It's school teachers that open the door and invite the, the uh, students in to participate in a great conversation. Uh, and, and so there's got to be that comfort, that safety present. But there's also uh, an issue of safety in the schools, which administrators often focus on and too often to the detriment of making the schools better. And what I have in mind in that case is, uh, you know, every time somebody, you know, stabs a knife into another student or shoots another student and something like that happens, um, we panic across the country. And one of the things that happens is uh, you'll find school districts spending a lot of money to put metal detectors into their schools and to hire um, uh, police officers. When I went to um, the high school, you know, many, many years ago, of course, you know, I had to walk through drifts of snow, 10 feet tall and climb mountains, 10 miles to get there every day. Um, seriously, um, many years ago, uh, I went to a high school of 4,400 kids. Once in the whole time I was in high school, a police car came to that school and everybody gossiping was going all over the school. The police are here. Oh my gosh, what happened? Why are the police here? And the idea that there would be police regularly on campuses is astonishing to me. And I have students of mine who have told me that even in junior high, they have police on campus. And on occasion, you may have a junior high student trying to get in a fight with the campus police officer. I'm amazed at that. Now, keep that in mind. And keep in mind when you start buying metal detectors to put in the schools and administrators say, say things like, well, we have to keep our students safe. I don't see what you've done to keep your students safe. I saw a large urban high school, they kept their students safe and they had no police officers and they had no metal detectors. A metal detector may be useful, but it's only a band-aid and it's only useful in the short term. A police officer may be useful, but again, it's only a band-aid and it's only useful in the short term. If you have students getting stabbed or shot, um, gangs beating up other kids in school, you can't fix that problem with a metal detector or a campus cop. The problem is much, much deeper. And if you want real solutions, you've got to look beyond the band-aids. I'm not saying that band-aids may not be useful for a time being, but I think it's irresponsible for administrators to say, I put a band-aid on the problem, and now I'm all done, I can go on to the next thing. I'm a pragmatic person. No, that's not pragmatic at all. You're just trying to escape from the depth of the real problem that needs to be addressed. And again, the Band-Aid may be useful for a while, but Band-Aids, like on our wounds that we get on ourselves, are always meant to be there temporarily until our tissue is restored, the Band-Aid can be removed, and all is good again. We're not looking forward into the future in our country to try to figure out and when all is restored, all will be good again. Instead, we just add another Band-Aid to another Band-Aid to another Band-Aid. If you have to keep on adding Band-Aids, it should come to mind that this isn't working and we're not addressing the deep problems. Sooner or later, all the Band-Aids in the world won't help you address the deep problems. 
But patching up seems to be a, a, a very common practice, not just in schools, but even in businesses. Mm -hmm. um, my very last uh, question, how does all of this, what you just talked about today, how does all of this bring us back to the, the great conversation of humankind? Well, the great conversation of humankind is our ideal. That's what everything that happens in education, everything that happens in the, in the schooling community, uh, to always have that ideal in mind. The ideal should never be, well, what can we do to keep weapons from coming in? We may have to do that, the band-aid, but that's never an ideal. Bringing students into the great conversation, that is the ideal. And so it gives us a standard, a measure, by which we can judge anything and everything we ever do in our educational system and in our schooling practices. To what extent does this practice or this policy contribute in the long run to students participating and learning how to participate in the great conversation of humankind? So when they have completed their education, they will forever be participants in the great conversation of humankind. Right now, as we're uh, taping this, we've got a taping, is that an old fashioned word? Uh, as, we, uh, as, as we're as uh, we taping this, we've got an election coming up. And so there are people with a number of opinions about one party or the other, or one candidate or the other. And if they are to be effective in persuading each other, they need to listen to each other. To really listen to each other, they need to respect each other. I'm not seeing a lot of respect being shown among the adult community for those they disagree with. And if the adults don't show respect for others to whom they, with whom they may disagree, well, don't expect the children to show respect to one another either. Don't expect the children to become participants in the great conversation of humankind because the adults in their world are not role modeling what it takes to be a participant in, in the great conversation of humankind. I, a question I often ask my students is, what's the first job of every child? In the first job of every child, in fact, actually it's the first job of every uh, young mammal. And that first job is to become an adult. And so from the moment they're born, they're watching. Neuroscientists even tell us that we have certain cells that they have nicknamed mirror, uh, mirror cells in our brain. And so if you look at an infant, and even if you look to another adult, and they can you smile, before they've even thought about it, they'll start smiling too. And it's not because they decided to smile, but it's because the mirror neurons already turned on and made the facial reflection um, uh, apparent to whoever it is that you're, you're talking to. The first job of every child is to become an adult. If the adults fail to role model what it takes to participate in a great conversation of humankind, then who is there for children to role model? They're certainly not gonna see adults on television that role model participation in the great conversation of humankind. Perhaps in, in a lot of the homes they come from, in the neighborhoods they come from, they won't see that either. As a result, so much, so much depends upon teachers. Teachers who know what the great conversation of humankind is. Teachers who are thrilled by their own participation in the great conversation of humankind. Teachers who just can't wait to extend the invitation to their students. Come on in to the great conversation of humankind. And here you're respected, you're welcome, you're gonna learn how to evaluate your own claims to know this or that, and how to evaluate the claims of others. You're gonna learn how to move from lack of understanding to a greater understanding of whatever it is that you engage in conversation about within that great conversation of humankind. Keep your eyes and your ears open. 
listen. And one day you will be a role model. And one day you will be in a position to bring others into that great conversation. Right now it's all up to the teachers. I don't see that we have other role models available. It's all up to the teachers. So the question has to be asked to every teacher. Are you up to the task? Again, I'm reminded of a phrase I used a few days ago. Ben Franklin came out of that Constitutional Convention. Reporter asked him, what kind of government do we have? And he said, we've given you a, um, a Republican form, the people, we have given you a Republican form of democracy, if the people can keep it. Teachers are the ones that have to do all the role modeling in our world today and have to make the invitation to participate in the great conversation, open and public and so on. Teachers cannot sacrifice the importance of that role to just preparing people for the next standardized test. Teachers cannot sacrifice that role just to walk through their job and say to themselves, well, I get paid the same whether I do this well or not, as long as my students get a certain score on a test, regardless of pay, regardless of how much credit you get for doing the right thing as a teacher, your standard of measurement should be for yourself, how well are you doing when it comes to inviting students into the great conversation of humankind, welcoming them, showing them the dispositions of asking, how do you know, and what do you mean by the term so-and-so? setting aside all prejudices of any kind, either for an idea or for other people. Those are all the things that measure your excellence as a teacher, not your pay, not your test scores. Have you brought the students into the great conversation of humankind? And when they leave you at the end of the year, will they be that much closer to being adults who will forever live participating in the great conversation of humankind with others? Wow, Dr. Wagner, you remind me of an incident. Um, as a dual credit um, advisor, I used to go to middle schools and elementary schools for college days or information nights. And some of those little kids, I talked to them like one on one when they had questions, and I would ask them, What would you like to be when you grow up? You would be surprised how many of them actually said that they want to be like Mr. Thomas or Mrs. Gutierrez or. Like no, not not that many students said that I want to be like mom or I want to be like that. They idolize their teachers. So I I think what you just said, um, it it is a it's a big thing uh, for teachers. It is a big task, and I thank you, and I'm sure Robbie feels the same, that you have included us in this great conversation, and we have learned a lot, and we continue to learn still, even though. We're not taking classes with you right now, but we're learning a lot and we feel like we're contributing to the great conversation. So thank you. I learn from you all the time. Obviously, did I get it right? <laughs> yes. 